بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلاما على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الانبياء وعلى اله الاسكياء واصحابه الاتقياء اما بعد It's been some time since we sat here last we had a very long break but inshallah aziz we intend to start again in Allah except from us So over the past year we started last year after Ramadan and we ended at Ramadan in one year we covered the first half of the book of Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi If you actually calculate how many pages remain until the book itself finishes it's no more than 50 pages left inshallah and at 50 pages we end the class and the book comes to an end So today we start from page 90 in the English translation and page 91 in the Arabic side part 2 of the book Al Qism al Thani the second part القول في اجتناب المعاصي on refraining from disobedience The first part of the book of Imam Ghazali rahmatullah alayhi that we've covered so far for those who attended you will remember that it was all about ta'at obedience in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So how to live 24 hours of your day in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's what we talked about 90 pages of discussion was based on this how to live your 24 hours of the day in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so from here onwards now imam ghazali rahmatullah alayhi takes the other idea and the other thing that we also need to know which things we should stay away from right the maasi the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which things we need to stay we've, all, we've already talked about things we need to do now we're talking about the things we need to stay away from Now in regards to the things we need to stay away from Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi categorizes it in two ways. The first portion he talks about the sin that is committed outwardly that a person uses his body parts to commit the sin engage in wrong. And then he talks about the inward sin the sins of the heart. So inshallah as we cover them we'll cover as we as we continue on we'll cover them inshallah. So he says i'lam inna anna ad-din shatran Know that this deen is made of two parts. Ahaduhuma tarku al-ma'asi wal akhir fi'l at-ta'at. The first of the two parts is refraining from disobedience and the other is the performance of acts of obedience. So the first act, one one part of it is the acts of obedience which we've already covered in the first part of the book and the second is regarding the refraining from disobedience. وَتَرْكُ الْمَنَاهِ هُوَ الْأَشَدُّ And the first is more important and more serious. So there's two aspects of the deen that we need to understand. The first is refraining from sin, refraining from disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second is the acts of worship. Imam Ghazali says both are important. However, the first, هُوَ الْأَشَدُّ, it's more severe. A little translation of ashad is, it is more, it's more severe. Now what does, it mean? what does he mean by it's more severe? <laughs> refraining from more severe, refraining from sin is more severe on a person. Right? The reason is because you have a very strong force pushing you in that direction, your nafs, and it's very severe on the human being to fight against the nafs. It's one of the greatest battles you'll have in your life against your own nafs. Because when you see your enemy, it's easy to, it's easy to attack your enemy. But when your enemy is hidden inside you, it's almost impossible to fight against your enemy. It becomes very hard. So here Imam Ghazali says, فَالطَّاعَةُ يَقْدِرُ عَلَيْهَا كُلُّ أَحَدٍ Obedience, every person is capable of, 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 of engaging in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَتَرْكُ الشَّهَوَاتِ لَا يَقْدِرُ عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا الصِّدِّقُونَ However, the abandoning and the leaving, leaving and the refraining of the desires only the true servants are capable of this only the true servants because when it comes to worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's very easy that you can do it in a group right you pray your salah in a group usually when we're fasting the houses are fasting as a group it becomes easier to do it when we perform hajj we perform it as a group right but when it comes to abandoning sins usually you have to do it individually and when you have to do something individually that's when that action becomes that much more harder for example your tahajjud salah The Hajjul Salah we perform as a group or individually throughout the year. It's individually. That's why it's that much more harder on the nafs 
to perform that act because you have to do it individually and you're not being pushed by other people to do it. So the same thing comes to the sins when it comes to these sins that you have to do them individually. You have to recognize what the sin is and you have to stay away from it. In the darkness of the night, no person is going to come and tell you what you're doing is wrong and stop doing it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already told you what's wrong. And now you have to stay away from it on your own. You know that you shouldn't be engaging in so, such a transaction or looking at such a person or doing so, saying so and so thing with your tongue. You know these things. But now it's your responsibility to stand up and fight against yourself and stay away and refrain from these things. So there are two schools of thoughts when it comes to this matter. Is it more difficult to stay away from the prohibited or is it more difficult to engage in the acts of worship? There are two schools of thoughts in this matter. The first school of thought as we see here as Imam Ghazali says, and Imam Ghazali says, which one is more harder? Staying away from sins is harder. This is Imam Ghazali's opinion. And he's provided proof for it by saying that, you know, he, he gives a hadith which will come to shortly. The second group of people, they say, no, it's actually harder to engage in good acts. The logic they provide is that in order to stay away from the haram, you have to simply, most of the times, not do something. Do you understand? So for example, rather than going there, just sit here, just don't go there, and in return you'll save yourself from a sin. Okay? Don't access your computer on certain hours of the night and you'll stay away from the sin. So you have to, you have to basically not do something. As opposed to an act of worship, you actually have to, you have to do something. It's an action itself, right? So one is, do you guys understand what he, the, 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 the explanation they give here? The one is that you don't have to do anything, so therefore they say that's easier in comparison to doing something when you have to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to actively get up from your bed, get up from your room, go to wudu, step out of the house, get in the car, drive to the masjid, step in the masjid, come to the front stuff, not talk, don't play around, don't backbite, you know, and then worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after all of this, you've performed an act of worship, you've done something. As opposed to not listening to music, just lie in your bed. And don't put the, ear, the earplugs in your ear and you won't end up listening to music, right? So this is the logic they provide. However, Imam Ghazali, is here in response, you know, in other books, in other writings of his, he refutes his opinion by saying that even though a person, when it comes to sin, right? When it comes to that, sometimes not doing something can be harder than doing something. Do you understand that? Sometimes not doing something can actually be harder than doing something. Especially when you have the force of the nafs and shaitan teamed against you, forcing you to do something, right? So he says, he, the example he gives is that, he gets, it's, a, it's a lengthy discussion, we don't need to go into it. Both perspectives are right, the reality is right. They're both difficult in their own manner. There's a mujahada that's required for both. We pray that Allah Azawajal grants us to do both, inshallah. Let's stay away from the haram and engage in the acts of good. I just thought I'd put that in front of you so you have the perspectives of the scholars also in front of you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says now, Imam Ghazali Rahmatullah the opinion that he provides, he also provides a proof from it, from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Qala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Muhajiru man hajar as-su, wal-mujahidu man jahad hawahu. That the migrating person, the true migrant, the true immigrant, sorry, the true immigrant, man hajar as-su, is the one who abandons evil. Right? So, Hijrah, to migrate from one place to another. Hijrah means, it comes from the Arabic root letter, ha ra hajara. And hajara means to leave. It means to leave and abandon something. The Prophet Wasallam uses this word in another hadith where he says, that, um, لَا يَحِلُّ لِمُسْلِمٍ أَنْ يَحْجُرَ أَخَاهُ فَوْقَ ثَلَاثًا It is not permissible for a person to leave his Muslim brother in conversation for more than three days. So where the Prophet ﷺ is talking about it is not permissible for you to leave your Muslim brother for more than three days, leave, leave your Muslim brother, the word he uses there is يَهْجُرَ أَخَاهُ يَهْجُرَ hajara. The same word is being used there, which means to leave something. So al-hijra means to leave one place and go to another place. And there is great reward for migration. For a person who migrates from one place to another in order to practice his deen or propagate the deen, there is great reward for this. So the Prophet ﷺ says that the greatest form of migration is that a person migrates from his sin and leaves the evil behind and walks towards the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And then the Prophet ﷺ says, وَالْمُجَاهِدُ مَنْ جَاهَدَ هَوَاهُ And the one who, the true warrior is the one who fights against his passions. Like I said earlier on, it's easier to strike your opponent if you know your opponent standing one foot away from you. But it's very hard to strike yourself when the nafs 
and the desires are all actually embedded inside your heart. That's the hardest battle that you're ever going to have. The former Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to the companions on the return of a battle, he said to them, Raja'na min jihad al-asghari ila jihad al-akbar. He said to the companions on the returning of a battle, he said to them, that today we have returned from a small jihad to the greater jihad. The battlefield was, a, was he, in this example, in this hadith, he refers to the battlefield as the smaller jihad. And is referring now to the struggle against yourself as the greater jihad, right? Now with that, Imam Ghazali, he moves forward and he establishes his heading now and he says, al ma'asiyatu bil jawarihi. The sins committed with the limbs. So the first discussion that Imam Ghazali will have now, he will now talk about the sins that are committed with the limbs. He says, وَعْلَمْ Know أَنَّكَ إِنَّمَا تَعْسِ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى بِجَوَارِحِكَ وَهِيَ نِعْمَةٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ وَأَمَانَةٌ لَدَيْكَ فَالْإِسْتِعَانَتُكَ بِنِعْمَةِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى عَلَى مَعْصِيَتِهِ غَايَةُ الْكُفْرَانِ وَخِيَانَتُكَ فِي أَمَانَةٍ أَوْدَعَكَهَا اللَّهُ غَايَةُ الْتُغْيَانِ فَإِنَّ عَضَاءَكَ رَعَايَاكَ فَانظُرْ كَيْفَ تَرْعَاهَا فَكُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ نُعِيَّتِهِ This is the first paragraph. He says here that indeed, إِنَّمَا تَعْسِ اللَّهَ بِجَوَارِحِكَ Indeed, most people worship, disobey Allah through their limbs, through the limbs of the body. Most people, they disobey Allah through the, using the limbs of the body. Then he says, وَهِيَ نِعْمَةٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ وَأَمَانَةٌ لَدَيْكَ And these limbs of Allah are actually a gift from Allah to you, and they are a trust with you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you these limbs as a favor, and they are a trust with you. A trust with you, what does this mean? Therefore, when we pass away, we say, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجُوا We came from Allah, and today when this person passes away, he's returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just as if I give you something and I tell you you have to return it back to me, you have to return it back in the very same condition. You have to return it back in the very same condition. This is where the scholars say it's not permissible to tattoo your skin or tattoo your body. Because that's not how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent you to the world. And therefore it's not permissible also to mutilate your body unnecessarily, right? If there is a medical reason, that's another thing. But otherwise you can't mutilate your body because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the body for a reason. He gave you the body as a trust. You need to return that body back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah azza wa jalla gave it to you in the first place. Okay. So Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi the unique thing about Imam Ghazali that you'll find is that he usually presents his point with proof that is appealing to the human psyche. You know, he doesn't just say that you shouldn't use your body to disobey Allah. He usually provide, he usually provide a, a platform to, per, to, to portray this opinion of his using the human psychology. So he's saying here that look, you use your body parts to disobey Allah, and Allah gave them to you as a favor. This is a blessing of Allah. This is a gift from Allah. This is a trust for you. So now he says that, so for you to use the blessing of Allah to disobey Allah is the greatest form of great ungratefulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you guys understand that? For you to use the blessing of Allah to disobey Allah is the greatest form of ungratefulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is your cheating in the trust of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, for indeed your body parts are your responsibility. So be careful how you watch after your responsibility. So the example of this is that a father gives his son $10. Right? And that son, with those $10, okay, the father is not a good example. Let's say a friend. Okay? One friend gives his friend $10. Or he gives him $200. Right? He gives his friend $200. With those $200, his friend, he goes to the store, he buys a gun, buys a bullet, and comes back and shoots his own friend. Now, how would we look at this person? Traitor, that's it? We'd say, this person, you know, you know, this person's crazy, he's nuts. This is the limits of being ungrateful. That the $200 that you used to buy the gun and shoot him with, who gave you the $200? He was the same person that you shot who gave the $200 to you, right? One of my friends, a close friend of mine, he was telling me about um, Iraq during the days of Saddam Hussein. Now whether this story has any truth to it or not, Wallahu alam, Allah knows best, because I am not a witness to this. He told me this story as his own experience. He said that there was such oppression during those days 
for his, for his area, for the tribe that he lived in, that, you know, if anyone spoke against the government, the word would reach the government within moments. And they would come, shoot the person, and leave the execution bill behind for the family to take care of. Right? So that's like the limits of being ungrateful. That you use the bounty of that person, coming back to the example that Imam Ghazali rahmatullah gives here, right? Is that you're using the bounty of Allah, what Allah gave you, to go against Allah, to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, look, the body parts of Allah are your responsibility. You're responsible of these. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَ إِذِنَ عَنِ الْنَعِيمِ On that day, you will be asked regarding every single bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَا يُسْأَلُ عَمَّا يَفْعَلُوا وَهُمْ يُسْأَلُونَ You can't ask Allah about anything on the day of judgment. You can't question Allah. Allah will do all, well Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do all the questioning to you on that great day. So here Imam Ghazali is saying is that be careful of your body parts because they are your responsibility and watch over how you use this responsibility. فَكُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ For indeed every one of you is a shepherd. وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ أَنْ رُعِيَتِهِ And each and every one of you will be questioned regarding his flock. وَعَلَمْ أَنَّ جَمِيعَ أَعْضَائِكَ سَتَشْهَدُ عَلَيْكَ فِي عَرَصَاتِ الْقِيَامَةِ بِلِسَانٍ ذَلِقٍ يَفْضَحُكَ اللَّهِ عَلَى مَلَئٍ مِّنْ خَلَائِقٍ He says, be careful and know. In Arabic, when we use the word wa'lam, this word is used very commonly, wa'lam. Wa'lam means, literally translated, we say, no. You know, let me give some flavor to what the word wa'lam actually means. The word wa'lam actually means pay attention now. Be aware of what we're going to say. Gain this knowledge and drill it inside your mind, the next point that we're going to make. So usually when the author of any book says wa'lam, that means the next point he's making is actually the punchline. He's making an important statement, so pay attention to it. So here, Imam Ghazali says, Wa'alam, verily you should know, pay attention now. That these body parts that you're using to disobey Allah, they will all stand in front of Allah on the Day of Judgment and they will testify against you. They will testify against you. And they will testify with a clear tongue, with a very clear statements. They won't be murmuring or, you know, hiding. They'll speak very openly against you. Very openly, these body parts are going to speak against you. And he says, they will disgrace you on the day of judgment in front of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These body parts that you use to disobey Allah, they will shout against you on the day of judgment in front of all of the creation and you will be disgraced in front of them. Your father and mother will be shameful to see the son, will, to, will be shameful to see you when they realize all the things you did which they can never imagine you doing because they thought so well of you. On that day, your body parts will testify against you. And he provides the proof of this from the Quran. Where Allah Azza wa Jal says, يَوْمَ تَشْهَدُ عَلَيْهِمْ أَلْسِنَتُهُمْ وَأَيْدِيهِمْ وَأَرْجُلُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, On that day, your tongues, أَلْسِنَتُهُمْ Their tongues and their hands and their feet will testify against them regarding the things they did in this world. The tongues, the hands, and the feet will clearly say that, Oh Allah, He did this wrong. Oh Allah, He did that wrong. And the narrations mention that the mouth will be sealed up and the body parts will begin to speak. And in one hadith, then one verse of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Yaseen. اليوم نختم على أفواههم Today we will seal off their mouths. Right? The lips will join together and the mouth will be sealed off. وَتُكَلِّمُنَا أَيْدِيهِمْ And their hands will speak to us. وَتَشْهَدُ أَرْجُلُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ And their feet will testify against him for those things which they did inside this world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning us again. Be careful because your body parts will test against, testify against you on the Day of Judgment. So he says, فَحْفَذْ جَمِيعَ بَدَنِكْ Be aware and safeguard your entire body. وَخُصُوصًا أَعْضَائِكَ السَّبَعَةِ Especially seven parts of your body. There are seven parts of the body which the human being generally uses to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many parts? And in this first part of the disobedience, he will cover these seven parts. And then Imam Ghazali says, so he says that be aware of seven parts of your body. He says, for indeed the fire of hell also has seven doors. For indeed the fire of hell also has seven gates through each of which a particular group is destined to enter. Right, subhanAllah, look, look at the, look, he's, 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 he's quoting a verse of the Quran. وَلَا يَتَعَيَّنُ لِتِلْكَ الْأَبْوَابِ إِلَّا مَنْ عَصَ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى بِهَذِهِ الْأَعْضَى And he says, the only ones designated to enter through these gates 
are those who disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the means of these body parts. And what are these body parts? He says, وَهِيَ الْعَيْنُ وَالْأُذْنُ وَالْلِسَانُ وَالْبَطَنُ وَالْفَرَجُ وَالْيَدُ وَالْرِجْلُ These are the seven body parts that the human being generally uses to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are they? Al-Ain. Al-Ain means the eye. Wal-Udhun. The ear. Wal-Lisan. The tongue. Wal-Batan. The stomach. Wal-Farj. The private part. Wal-Yad. The hand. And Wal-Rijlu. The feet. He says, be aware of these, of your, these seven body parts of yours. Now Imam Ghazali, he will list each one of these body parts. And when he lists them, he will tell us how we use these body parts to disobey Allah. But he doesn't leave it there. He actually shows us how to use the body part to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he'll tell us how to use that body part to obey Allah. And then he'll also tell us how most people end up using that body part to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He starts off by saying, أَمَّا العين, As for the eye. فَإِنَّمَا خُلِقَتْ لَكَ لِتَهْتَدِيَ بِهَا فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ وَتَسْتَعِينَ بِهَا فِي الْحَاجَاتِ وَتَنْظُرَ بِهَا إِلَى الْعَجَائِبِ الْمَلَكُوتِ الْأَرْضِ وَالسَّمَاوَاتِ وَتَعْتَبِرَ بِهَا وَتَعْتَبِرَ بِمَا فِيهَا مِنَ الْآيَاتِ He says, that the eye was created so you can use, so you can guide with it in the darkness. So you can see with it in the darkness. And so you can use it as assistance at the time of need. When you need to see something, you can use that eye. And he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this eye so you can look into the amazing kingdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the skies and the earth and find and seek the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the, sky, within the skies and the earth. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ لَآيَاتٍ لِأُولِ الْأَلْبَابِ In the skies, in the earth, in the creation of the skies and the earth, in the coming and going of the day and the night, there are signs for those people who are intellectual. So use this eye of Allah, that given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to look at the creation of Allah, to ponder over the creation of Allah, because this will bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he says, so this is how the eye should be used. Now however he says, فَحْفَظْهَا عَنْ أَرْبَعِين Save your eye from four things. أَن تَنْظُرَ بِهَا إِلَىٰ غَيْرِ مَحْرَمٍ Number one. وَإِلَىٰ سُورَةٍ مَلِيحَةٍ بِشَهْوَةِ نَفْسٍ Number two. أَوْ تَنْظُرَ بِهَا إِلَىٰ مُسْلِمٍ بِعَيْنِ الْإِحْتِقَارِ Number three. أَوْ تَطَّلِعَ بِهَا إِلَىٰ عَيْبِ مُسْلِمٍ Number four. Four things he says do not let your eye do. The first thing. Do not let, do not let it look at the marriageable women. Or marriageable men. People that you can marry, people who are your, right? غَيْرَ مَحْرَمٍ People who are not haram upon you, people who you can marry, right? Be careful to not look at such people. It is not allowed for you to do that. People easily justify it by saying, oh, they're just my cousins. It's okay. Right? We don't look at each other that way. You have to understand when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set a principle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has considered your mahram as your your cousins as your ghayr mahram. You can marry them. This is, this is in the Quran. You'll find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not list them amongst the people who you cannot marry. So when the deen has already defined who are the people who you can look at, who are the people you can't look at from the opposite gender, we should not use our intellect to supersede and overrule the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, you want to find out who are the people who truly act upon the deen and who, people, who are the people who act upon culture mixed with deen. This is a very good masala to look into, right? The people who act upon deen purely, in matters like this where our community and society looks on it very lightly, they will take these things seriously too. As the people who act upon religion mixed with culture, when it comes to matters of being, dealing with your cousins, especially when our culture teaches us, oh, it's not a big thing, we're very loose in these matters. That's when you can judge yourself to see where you are in terms of your sharia and where you are in terms of your culture. What motivates you to act upon your deen? Is it your culture or is it your deen? Is it the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Now, one thing interesting I found out, even though this isn't related to what we're saying, somewhat is. In the state of Illinois, it's actually illegal to marry your first cousin. Right? Did you guys know that? I was sitting with some lawyers the other day and we had a class. They were teaching us, they were, they were going through a little seminar with some imams uh, with regards to some law that we should be aware of. And one of, the, one of these things that we covered is that 
In the state of Illinois, it's considered incest. And for the one who performs the marriage, and those who get married, there could be a penalty on all of them. So, you know, this is a big problem. One friend of mine, um, he wanted to get married, for and, um, and his wife was coming from, either the wife or the husband, actually the wife was, he's my friend, he was in America. The wife was coming from, um, from abroad, India, Pakistan, whatever country it is. And he wished to have his, they were first cousins, and he wanted to have the marriage registered in the state of Illinois. And in the state of Illinois, that's illegal to marry your first cousin. So they couldn't actually do it. In order to even file for the immigration papers, he had to move to another state, get married, first stay there, remain there as a resident, get married there, and then after that, he, had the, he was given the chance to apply for the visa. <coughs> this is a little something extra. Just bear this in your mind. It may be useful at some point in your life. You can maybe help someone if, they're, um, if, they, if you fear they may get stuck in this matter. Anyway, so here Imam Ghazali Abdullah says, be aware of looking at those people who you can marry, right? Be aware of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the sinful or the lustful gaze. And the second thing, so the first point is talking about from the opposite gender. So be aware of looking at the people who you are not supposed to be looking at from the opposite gender. And the second thing he says, and also for certain people, even from the same gender, you need to be careful for looking at people who you may have shahwa or desire towards. Right? So what he's saying here is that any gaze that creates lust within the person, to look towards that individual is now no longer permissible for you. So whether it's from the same gender or the opposite gender, you need to be careful of this matter. And then the third thing he says, and be careful of looking at a Muslim with the eye of belittling that person. Sometimes we look at another person and say, oh, he's nothing compared to me. He's not a scholar. He's not a doctor. He's not a lawyer. What is that person? He's a, you know, he's this, he's that. We belittle people very easily, okay? He's not a rich person like I am. He doesn't drive a car like I do. Oh, he drives a Toyota. Come on, step your game up and get into the Lexus League now, right? So we belittle people. So Imam Ghazali says, don't belittle anyone. Because Allah knows who you are. Allah knows who he is. Allah knows who she is. Allah knows who you are. So there's no need for you to become judgmental and start judging people based off their economical life, right? And where they are in terms of their finance. And the fourth thing that Imam Ghazali Ali says here is save your eye from remaining in the search of the faults of other people. Save your eye from searching for the faults of other people. Similar to the previous one, that one we're actually belittling people. And this one you're actually looking for other people's faults. So you're saying, oh, you're not, your hat isn't served. Oh, you're, you didn't do ruku properly. Oh, you didn't say salamu alaykum properly. And you didn't do this properly. You didn't do that properly. All we do is walk around and point fingers towards other people and we forget ourselves. Imam Ghazali Abdullah continues from here and he talks about the other parts of the body. However, we'll, since this is the first class, I think we'll keep it short and inshallah we'll end here. And from next week, inshallah, we'll move on. Um, for those who have the book, it's very interesting. I would encourage you to read uh, before you come to class. Inshallah, you can implement it throughout the week, and then we can re discuss it in the class. It'll be a revision for you. For those of you who don't have a book, inshallah, we'll be discussing this in class anyway. May Allah Azza wa Jal grant us the ability to act on what has been said. Subhanallah, bihamdi, subhanakallah, bihamdi. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfirukun wa tubu ilaykum akhru da'wana. Alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.